Welcome to the Legit Crypto Projects. Um, this is the place to discover all your latest upcoming Legit projects. Uh, we appreciate Dave joining us today. Uh, he's come from Everun. Um, we hope we're going to bring some valuable insights in the next hour or so. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Dave, who's prepared a little bit of a presentation for us. Obviously, if you're, you're listening on Spotify, you're not going to benefit from the video. But, uh, feel free to check it out on uh, YouTube. So I'll hand over to Dave. Um, let him introduce himself and uh, give us some information on the token. And after that, we'll run through some questions myself, and then we'll hand over to the community to ask any questions. Excellent. Thank you, Topster. Really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much, Legit, Legit Crypto uh, Group, for allowing us to host today or to present to you today. Um, as mentioned, uh, I'm Dave Raman. Um, uh, I am presenting to you EverEarn today uh, as the project lead, uh, basically as the face of the team. Um, straight off the bat, of course, uh, EverEarn is a rewards token um, at the highest level. Um, so 11% BUSD rewards. The 11% is on all buys, sells, uh, and transfers. Total tax is 15%. So 11% goes towards the BUSD rewards, 1% uh, to the auto liquidity, 1% to a buyback and burn mechanism, and 2% to marketing. Um, so just to give you that full, real uh, top uh, overview. Uh, what I will usually do is I jump straight into the trust items, of course. So first and foremost, just going to scroll down on the website. For those of you um, that can't see the screen, I'm scrolling down onto the website, down into the team section, uh, where you'll be able to see uh, that the core team is doxed. Um, of course, there's myself, Dave Raman, followed by Trent Butler, Erico Gomez, and Aaron Perez, uh, with our photos um, and countries of origin or countries of nationality, uh, along with our LinkedIn profiles, and of course, uh, you can click on those LinkedIn profiles. You will see um, those individuals' LinkedIn profiles uh, the, as their professional LinkedIn profiles. I'll jump over to mine so you could see that as well. Um, so there is my LinkedIn profile. Um, you can take a look and see how many connections I have. You can see my work history on there, uh, along with some of my education, uh, some of the recommendations from colleagues and stuff. Uh, of course, we are KYC'd on pinksale.finance, uh, KYC and audited on pinksale.finance. We are, because we are a pre-sale token at this moment, we are, of course, already as well KYC on PooCoin, which is a requirement in order to get a pre-sale token ad advertising onto PooCoin. Uh, and we are also KYC with flues.trade uh, because we've got their swap app already on our website. And I will scroll over to that in a moment. Uh, additional trust items, of course, is the fact that we do have our tech audit audit already completed. That was actually completed before we opened up um, any of the socials uh, or our TG or even put up the website. I'll just quickly scroll uh, down to where it shows uh, any issues or concerns. Um, and as we can see on page six, for those of you without a screen, um, no issues to note, uh, critical, high, medium, low, or note nothing, everything has passed. Um, we also have the, of course, Interfi audit already completed as well, which is that higher level of um, audit as opposed to the tech audit. Um, and if you scroll down again, you're going to see that we do have, according to Interfi, one low risk severity. If you scroll down to page 15 or 19, trying to remember which one it is now, uh, my apologies for the dead air. Try not to do that. Um, so quickly scrolling down to page 19, we will see, and I've lost track of where I am. That's great. Sorry, there we go, page 15. Uh, specifically, it is the blacklist function um, that has scored us the low severity issue. There is a blacklist function specifically in our wallets. Uh, sorry, in the contract, um, and I will talk a little bit about that as the presentation goes on. So that's what has scored us the low risk severity is a blacklist function. Jumping back over to the website, obviously the website is where the vast majority of the advertising leads people to. Um, so this is where you know uh, visitors hit for the purpose of hopefully being converted into investors. Um, so we'll just quickly go through the website. Um, because it is just meant to convert it, visitors into potential investors in the project. Um, so right off this, right out of the gate, of course, we do have our rewards calculator. 
that's already up. Uh, this gives potential investors the ability to uh, get an estimate of the rewards that they could expect based upon what they hold and how much volume is. So if you were to buy one BNB worth of tokens uh, during pre-sale, uh, of course, you're going to get 46 million tokens. So we'll punch in that number. Uh, 40, oh yeah, 46 million, sorry, one, two, three. Um, and if we assume a daily volume of let's say 500,000 uh, and it cost me one BNB, which I believe right now is running at 370, um, we can see that based upon 500K of volume, one BNB worth of tokens will net me approximately $71.77 in BUSD. Um, maintaining that over the course of the year now becomes highly subjective, but you can see what you would get, you know, weekly, monthly, yearly, uh, and what the annual percent yield on that would be. Uh, really great tool just to satisfy um, members in the TG community asking about, you know, what's the calculation? How does it work? How, how much could I calculate out if, if uh, all things were equal based upon volume? Of course, back to the website, we do also have the dashboard um, that we've got published already. The dashboard is where you can initially see uh, how many rewards you have accumulating in BUSD. Uh, you can also claim at any point in time your rewards. Uh, you'd have to pay for the gas, uh, but if you're patient, then based upon volume, of course, the rewards pay out up to every hour uh, with no gas fees to you. But if you're impatient like me sometimes, um, you can come here and just you know claim now right away and, and you'll pay the small gas fee. Um, the uh, dashboard, of course, uh, we call it Everdash. The rewards calculator is in the process of being moved over to the dashboard, uh, along with a news page, along with uh, a daily task uh, page. Um, as we move forward with some of the tools that you're going to see on the roadmap, the point of having the Everdash dashboard is for that to become uh, your one-stop hub where you can gain access to the tools um, that you use for the day-to-day -day trading. So these would be the things such as uh, the liquidity, <clears throat> liquidity pooling, um, staking, uh, NFT minting, uh, obviously the dashboard, access to all of the socials, uh, access to the swap as well. Um, so all of your tools in one place um, so that you really just have the convenience of being able to access everything right there. Back to the website, of course, uh, and we'll quickly go through this. Uh, obviously, we have the important links by now, the contract, uh, the white paper as well. Um, we do have the countdown to the pre-sale, so we're at uh, basically two days away, 48 hours away, essentially. Um, we jump into the smarter contract, which we've, uh, we've already covered. That's just the basic tokenomics, so the 11% rewards, 1% liquidity, 1% buyback and burn, and 2% marketing. Uh, life on your terms, the links to the socials, the contract features, which essentially, again, of course, this is for the, you know, the visitor conversion benefit, essentially the same way of representing the tokenomics just differently, except it does go over the fact that there is an anti-whale measure in place. Um, and I will cover a little bit of our thought process behind it, but there is an anti-whale measure in place, which is a 0.25% maximum transaction uh, of the total supply. So that's a 250 million token maximum transaction uh, on buy or sell or transfer. Uh, the website then goes rather quickly through some of the features um, that investors could expect to see as the project develops. Uh, of course, uh, NFT minting, NFT marketplace, uh, creator and subscriber services. Uh, the point behind that, of course, is the continued development of an ecosystem which supports the tokenomics all the way through. So the ability to use EverEarn to purchase services uh, and you would only have uh, either a transaction fee uh, or if you're using EverEarn uh, and there you have to pay the tokenomics, then a way to get that tokenomics back so that essentially you're only paying the transaction fee. But if you're not and you're using any other currency to buy services, um, then you're paying the full uh, tokenomics and you are therefore supporting uh, the tokenomics back to all of the investors. Um, Ever swap and DAP. Uh, so of course the swap where you can swap your tokens, the DAP uh, of course is, is the entire environment where we're hosting the DAPs on the dashboard. And as you can see, we've already got our swap up and running. We've actually had our swap up and running uh, since we opened up the website and the socials um, just seven days ago. Um, within the swap, of course, you can already swap EverEarn. Uh, you can't do it at the moment because, of course, trading hasn't yet been enabled, but you can see by default it opens right up to EverEarn. 
uh, for BNB. You can see that we've got the golden seal check mark uh, that shows that we've been KYC'd through flues.trade. Um, we went with flues.trade and we get a little bit into this as well as we move forward uh, because of our view on how to run a project uh, and the way it should be run. Um, so we went with flues.trade. We've got a very nice feature rich swap. Uh, you can already buy BNB &B with fiat options applicable either to the country there where you're located or if you're using a VPN, uh, then the VPN route that you're coming in. So depending upon your route into the crypto world, uh, your fiat options are MoonPay, Ramp, uh, Apple Pay, Google Pay, uh, Visa, credit card, um, or, you know, again, whatever fiat options are considered legal within the route that you're coming into uh, the crypto space. So already have the ability to do fiat pay. Um, you already have access to the chart. If we were trading, you'd have access to the chart. Right now, of course, it's not going to show anything because we're not trading yet, but straight to bogged finance uh, with the chart. And of course, you've got the ability to share and earn. So there is also a referral system there uh, where if you refer friends and they use your referral code, uh, then you make a fraction of the trading that they perform, which is taken out of the transaction fee for the swap. So really robust feature rich swap um, straight out of the gate, even before we're live. Um, and just an absolutely fantastic tool. And we were really happy about the collaboration. Uh, continuing just uh, the completion of uh, some of the development that investors can expect, expect to see, of course, will be an, an Ever Wallet and Tracker. So uh, the Ever Wallet and Tracker is where you have a graphic rich uh, graphical user interface to be able to view your wallet, uh, whether your wallet uh, has tokens or NFTs um, within uh, Binance Smart Chain or Ethereum or Matic. Um, you'll be able to see on the different blockchains what your wallet holds, uh, but in a graphical interface format. So you'll be able to see the icons, you'll be able to see the images of the NFTs you have, uh, you'll be able to see uh, you know what your highest earners are. Um, again, this will all be on the Ever Dash app dashboard. So really, again, a uh, one-stop shop. And as we continue the development of the ecosystem, at some point, um, that Ever Wallet and Tracker will be free to Ever Earn holders, but would be part of the subscriber services uh, for anyone who doesn't hold Ever Earn. So uh, subscriber services, um, where they're charged a fee to gain access to the ecosystem, um, this would be part of that fee to be able to access to be able to gain access to the Wallet and Tracker. The initial token distribution, of course, we start out with 100 million, excuse me, 100 billion tokens uh, is the initial supply. Um, right away, we've got 20% locked for staking, 15% locked for other exchange listings, 43% goes to the public presale, of which 60% is locked liquidity, 15% of the initial supply is burned prior to launch, along with the 2% that pink sale takes as part of the selling fee. So those 2% tokens, uh, we've already communicated to pink sale that we will be buying those back and burning them. Uh, it equates to about 500 million tokens. So 15% plus 500 million tokens will be burned prior to launch. 5% uh, to the team wallets and 2% uh, has been set aside for uh, pre-launch airdrop contests. Uh, a note of point about the team wallets, uh, you know, depending on the project that you're looking at, these wallets could be called anything from a developer wallet to a marketing wallet to a legacy holders wallet or board of directors wallet. At the end of the day, if the wallet is designed to generate income for the purpose of the team to use the project, uh, it, 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 it's a team wallet. Um, you've pretty much got very few options available to you when it comes to team wallets. One is locking them, investing them. Um, the problem with locking, of course, is that that immediately locks the team out of any funds coming in, but if you don't lock them, then you have the issue of, how do you know the team's not going to sell uh, right away, for instance? Um, so we've approached it from blacklisting those wallets within the contract. Uh, within our TG group main, we've published the contracts, uh, sorry, published the wallet addresses. Uh, we've published the transaction that shows that we have blacklisted them. Of course, anyone in the community can go and check at any time to see that they are conti they continue to be blacklisted. But what it does is it then gives the team the ability to access uh, the BUSD reward income for the purpose of paying for the project to move forward, uh, paying for the development, paying for the moderators, uh, and so on and so forth. But no ability to uh, move the tokens or sell the tokens. 
Continuing along, we've got a compare yourself uh, dashboard, which will be more applicable uh, at once we launch and have some additional numbers to put behind our project. We have compared ourselves, or we're going to be comparing ourselves against Mario, Floki, Toon, King, Hodel for Gold, and Forever Pay. They are also BUSD rewards tokens. I want to make sure that I'm clear about something right from the start. Uh, we picked these ones, th these projects, because they were recently new, basically all within the last two months, because they are also BUSD reward tokens like we are, and because they have very different tokenomics and setups than we do. Because it's very easy to say, well, I have the highest paying rewards token. It, it's very simple. Make your tax 100%, pay back 99% in BUSD, 1% to liquidity, uh, and you're done. Nobody can do that. Nobody can get higher than you. Um, the reality is, though, as we all know, that that doesn't quite work. Um, so we have compared ourselves against uh, other BUSD reward tokens who have very different tokenomics and very different breakdowns, specifically for the purpose to show that we will be the highest paying BUSD rewards ratio token, meaning the way we have our entire offering set up will, in fact, mean that investors and holders will be receiving a much higher ratio uh, in rewards than other BUSD rewards tokens. So absolutely no disrespect uh, in any way, shape, or form towards the projects that are listed here. They're listed here purely for that criteria. In no way, shape, and form is there any negativity towards them as far as we're aware they're all legit projects, um, and it's purely a comparison chart. The roadmap, of course, uh, starts back in November. Um, where the team began doing all of the research and development, uh, checking off all the boxes of everything that it needed to do to get to where we are today. Um, we do, of course, as we go through here, and we do need to come back around and update a couple of these because they've already been completed. Um, but we're basically at that point now where, uh, you know, Thursday afternoon, if you're in the Eastern time zone, Thursday afternoon, we're hitting the pre-sale. Uh, and Friday afternoon uh, in the Eastern time zone, we're hitting the launch. Excuse me one moment. Just had to take <clears throat> take a drink of water. Uh, so that brings us to launch, and then that brings us to the immediate uh, time of delivering on the roadmap. Uh, and we have a very aggressive development schedule. We intend to, within the month of February, uh, deliver, well, we've already delivered the swap, but we intend to deliver the staking ability, the liquidity pooling ability, uh, and the ability to mint NFTs all within the first four to six weeks of the project going live. Um, this is very different uh, in the space that we're in now uh, because no one else has shown um, that they can plan for or produce a development schedule that quickly. Um, and in a moment, I'm going to explain to you why uh, so many people consider that to be aggressive, uh, but we actually don't consider it to be aggressive at all and how it's going to support uh, bringing in more and more investors as we move forward. So we're going to quickly uh, hop over to the white paper, uh, being respectful of the time that we have remaining. <clears throat> so in the white paper, if you've read white papers before, of course, you know they can be very dry and boring. In most instances, a white paper is really just a website without any images um, and spends a fair bit of time talking about the history of the blockchain, the history of DeFi, um, or some you know notes about Vitter and Vitalik and stuff. We, we don't do that. Um, our white paper really does deliver uh, the meat and potatoes of what the purpose of the project is, what we intend to solve, how we intend to go about doing that, uh, how we plan to do that, uh, and why we believe that we're going to be successful with this project. Skipping past some of the uh, content that you can go back and read yourself and highlighting the important things, so we're jumping past the introduction, jumping past the abstract, uh, stopping for a moment on ever earn is the solution. Um, so there's a couple of items that we've identified that we believe are problems within the crypto space. Uh, first one being low reward amounts. So this would be reward tokens where the amount of reward going back to investors is less than 9%, um, even as low as you know 2 and 3%. Um, you know, if you get in from the very beginning, great, uh, bully for you. If you don't get in from the very beginning and the project is doing well, um, very quickly, uh, the, the, the price of the tokens to get in, um, just doesn't give you a high enough ratio to make the rewards worth it anymore. And then teams run into the problem of how do we attract investors when all of a sudden, you know, $5,000 worth of tokens, uh, isn't even getting me a dollar worth of rewards because the, the, 
you know, the price is just too high. Um, so we're looking at that as being, you know, this is why we've gone with the much higher 11%. We wanted to make sure we didn't go past that 15% tax. So 11% rewards um, to give investors a much longer runway to be able to get in um, and hopefully continue to stay in with a fairly good price point. Uh, burning 50% of the tokens or more at the launch, um, and then also either never burning any more again or, or burning an infinitesimally small amount. Um, you can't really call yourself a deflationary token um, if you do, in fact, burn half your supply at the start and then never burn again. Um, the whole point of a deflationary token is that it is a constant dwindling supply. Um, so without a regular and impactful burn of tokens, uh, you really aren't deflationary anymore. Uh, this is why with EverEarn, uh, we will be burning 15% to start, uh, in addition to the 500 million that we buy back from Pink Sale, and then we will be burning a minimum of 5 million tokens a day every single day for up to the next six months, minimum of 5 million tokens a day. Uh, massive tax to project teams, um, and along that as well, a little lower, um, uh, large wallets held by the teams. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, in the, the whole purpose of an investor is to make money. Um, they're down in this space to make money, to invest in projects that could have potential. Uh, they want to make money. They want to be able to sell. They want to be able to ape back in. But if we are punishing sellers, uh, so we're increasing the taxes or we're uh, implementing a lot of measures that make it difficult uh, to sell and then buy back in, then all you're really doing is uh, irritating the investor on their way out. Um, and now you've essentially got an angry customer who's not coming back. Uh, they're selling and they're walking away and they're moving on to the next thing because they feel they haven't been treated fairly or they've been screwed over, or they've been ripped off. Um, so, you know, again, we're not going to do that. Um, it, it's 15% buy, 15% sell. Um, there's no changes there. There's no special tax in the beginning of the project. There's no uh, additional measures beyond that 0.25% max transaction limit specifically to prevent big dumps on the chart um, because we want investors to know that we do believe it's your right to try and make money when and where you can. And we want you to feel confident that you're going to continue to make money in this project. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, reinvent, reinventing the wheel over months of time. So again, we don't understand why in this space, uh, some of these uh, tools are stretched out over months of time. Six months ago, seven months ago, you know, having your own swap, having your own liquidity pool, having your own uh, um, uh, NFT Mint, these were really big things because they were brand new for small projects. These are not brand new anymore. We believe that these are basic services. Uh, so part of our aggressive roadmap is to show that, in fact, investors can begin to view these as basic services. And the new expectation within the crypto space should be that projects are able to roll these out fairly quickly. And that's what we intend to demonstrate. Uh, of course, um, massive amounts allotted to project teams. So this would be teams with wallets holding, you know, 6%, 10%, 15% or more. Uh, it's all well and fine to say you're paying out a certain amount of rewards to the investor. Um, but if the team is holding, you know, upwards of 20% of the tokens, um, then the investors really aren't getting the maximum amount of rewards that they could uh, because a significant amount is going back to the team. Uh, we've done the math and we've, we've figured that, you know, if we do our job properly, uh, then a 5% of the tokens reserved for the team for the purpose of generating income, for the purpose of running the project, is, is more than enough and is reasonable um, so that that remaining uh, rewards all go back to the investor. Uh, our philosophy is really simple, uh, which is to really ape the ethos of DeFi uh, and distribute wealth to the greatest amount of people. Uh, we want this project to succeed. We want people to have confidence in this project. Um, and we want people to be able to make money and, and, and feel good about it. Um, from a core values perspective, we look at, you know, it's one thing to say it's a project because that's where we really are, the project phase. But we're looking at it as a business. So that means decisions based upon business rules. 
like you would if you were running a standard brick and mortar business. So looking at the return on investment, total cost of ownership, fastest turnaround time, best quality and value, right? Uh, you don't successfully run a real world business by trying to hire every in-house professional you can and do all the development yourself in-house. That's not how the world works anymore. You go out to specialists who specialize in a service, who are therefore able to give you that service much more cheaply and usually at a higher quality and a faster turnaround time than you could do it in-house. Um, that most project teams choose to do the vast majority of their development in-house, often relying on uh, you know one or two people to do all of the work, creating single points of failure. That is exactly what we want to avoid. And this is why we believe that we can deliver the time schedule or the development schedule um, that we've initially set out so that we can establish that this does work. Um, no one on the team would need to be spending eight, nine, 10 hours a day on the project because what they should be doing is spending a few hours a day properly managing people uh, and then they've got the rest of their time because they still do have families. They still do have a life like everyone else here. Uh, and if you properly manage your time and you're set up properly, um, then this should all work exactly the way it does in the real world efficiently. Uh, trust isn't given, it's earned through action. So of course, this is why we've done the triple KYCs, the two audits so far, uh, pink sale, flues trade, core team is doxed on the website. Um, we're here for the people. So investors are here to make money full stop. We understand that. Uh, although we do have to invest in having a strong community, the investors aren't here to make friends. They're here uh, to see us deliver on the project and in the process make money. Uh, and then being ethically fair. And ethically fair, fair means that we clearly understand that we do not have the right to make decisions that we feel are best, but that we are required to make decisions that is in fact uh, in the best interest of the investors and the project. We've already gone through the tokenomics, um, the 11%, 1%, 1%, 2%, um, the initial token distribution we've already walked through, so we're gonna skip past that. Um, the buyback and burn we've already discussed, so that's 15% at launch, uh, plus 5 million tokens a day minimum, plus the 500 million tokens that will be burned after pink sale is over from that 2%. We also have a, a solar flare function, which is a proprietary process, both a buyback and burn, um, so that in the event um, that we do need positive pressure on the chart, uh, more so than the automated buyback and burn, we have that ability to apply positive pressure on the price chart. Um, the ecosystem, of course, uh, this is really just a more expanded version of what you've seen on the website. So it does walk you through the things that will be appearing on the roadmap, um, the Everdash dashboard, the swap, the wallet tracker, uh, staking, liquidity pooling, um, NFT minting, and then the marketplace, the creator services, and the subscriber services. We do take a note, <clears throat> a moment to note our opinion on exchanges, uh, which is quite simply while we've planned at some point to get on an exchange, uh, we do understand that simply going and getting on an exchange as fast as possible it, it is not, uh, not a good decision. We need to make sure that there is a need for it, uh, that the demand exceeds the supply, um, and that we make a smart and educated decision on when and which exchanges we will list on. Um, so we've got the token set aside for that planning, um, but in no way are we going to be pressured to get onto an exchange within a certain amount of time without that demand being there. Again, looking at it from a business, excuse me, sorry about that, looking at it from a business ethos and a business perspective. Uh, again, there's the chart uh, that you saw on the website um, where it does that comparison against the four other tokens, uh, which will be filled out as we start getting numbers on the chart. Uh, and then followed by uh, a page of definitions, which mostly is you know, just making sure that we're clearly defining a holder or an investor in relation to uh, in, uh, earning the rewards. Uh, of course, means that you've purchased on an exchange that supports the tokenomics. Um, so we're back over to the website again, uh, and just a final comment. So this is, you know, this is why at a very high level, um, I say that we're a, a rewards token, 11% BUSD. But as soon as you come down from that super high 10,000 foot view, um, we're not just a rewards token. Uh, we are a rewards token that has carefully crafted um, the highest amount of rewards to pay out within the 15% tax range. Um, with the smallest amount or among the smallest amount of 
team tokens held, um, limiting ourselves to 2% going to marketing. Basically, all of the other taxes either goes back to the project or the investors. Uh, we're burning only 15% of the supply off the start and truly maintaining that deflationary measure by making sure that we're burning a minimum of 5 million tokens a day. So every single day, uh, that remaining supply continues to decrease. And then, of course, we've also excluded uh, wallets that should never have or never get rewards in the first place. So, of course, by default, we all know that this means the dead wallet, but it also means the locked liquidity wallet will, is not eligible for rewards and will not receive rewards. The locked wallet for staking and the locked wallet for exchanges also will not receive rewards. Um, and, and why should they? The, th those wallets are not holders. They're not investors. So, those all of those rewards are being distributed amongst a much smaller distribution of coin, 34.6 billion tokens from start before we start burning tokens out of that supply. So that immediately ensures that already all of the holders will be immediately receiving a much higher amount of the share of rewards being generated. So that brings us to the conclusion of the presentation portion um, of this AMA. Uh, I really appreciate uh, you guys uh, listening. Um, and at this point, I would then, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen and I will open the floor to questions. Thank you. That was uh, very informative. Got uh, quite a few questions for you, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, absolutely. But, um, Please go right ahead. So I'll, I'll try and uh, structure this a little bit because um, <coughs> it's me, the first sorry. time that's okay. It's the first time we've kind of had someone come in and do a, a presentation, which is just different format to what we're used to. But it's nice in a way because I was able to sit back and listen. Um, Although that, that's that's what we want, right? We know it's not easy, um, so we wanted to make sure that we're we're presenting everything for everyone. Yeah, definitely. All right. So let's start from the beginning. Then uh, you guys, the team. Uh, obviously, I know. I mean, you've shown us the website and you're all fully docs and I've seen you in a video chat as well. So you are who you say you are. Yep. Um, what are you going at this full time? Is this going to be your full time work from now on? Or are you, you still going to be working a real life job or? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. And uh, that was a question that was asked uh, in the AMA uh, that we did with anti ruggers. It's not the first time this question was asked of me. And I am really glad you asked that as the first question because it's absolutely fair and relevant. Um, so I, I, I do have a full time day job. Um, so I do already work full time. Um, this means that I am not desperately relying on this project um, to be my bread and butter, um, nor do I think it should be. Um, uh, like I said, in the real world, if we compare it to a real business, um, if, if you start out opening your business doors and you are desperately relying on that income to come in to pay all of your bills, um, yeah, sure, you could say, you know, a person's going to be that much more passionate about it, but it also means they're drawing a full-time salary off of it. So they're immediately pulling out the maximum amount of income from it and draining it, uh, which can get really dicey when it comes time to making decisions on how much needs to be invested back into marketing, how much really should be invested into development, uh, and, and where those funds go. Uh, so yes, I am employed full time. Um, I have a very, very high work ethic, uh, which means I don't spend my employer's time working on this. Um, but that also plays into the way we have structured EverEarn. Um, so the way we've structured EverEarn is there is no single point of failure. So there is nothing uh, in the project that relies solely on me. Uh, the vast majority of my time is spent managing pieces of the project, um, which are often pieces that I can move without my attendance being there. So what I'm able to accomplish in two to three hours a day is much greater um, than if I sat there trying to do it all myself. No different than, uh, you know, for instance, Trent uh, or uh, Erico or Aaron, uh, you know, we are not using them as in-house developers. So they are not sitting there coding eight hours a day every single day after having already spent an eight hour day at their regular full-time jobs. What we're doing is we're partnering with developers, developer companies, such as for instance, Flu's Trade, who are specialists in their environment, who are able to development, who, sorry, who are able to deliver development faster 
better quality in a shorter amount of time and ultimately ultimately cheaper than what it would cost us. And the primary focus of uh, ones like Trent, myself, Aaron, and Erico is to vet what is coming back and being delivered. It also means that if any one of us cannot um, uh, continue on in the project, if life happens, if something gets in the way, if we become injured or sick, uh, or if, uh, you know, you've got a family member who's sick, it doesn't, It sorry, it means that work doesn't stop on the project. Uh, God forbid something catastrophic happens to someone and they have to step away. It means you don't have a single point of failure that crashes the project. You can hire a replacement, as it were, to then come in and fill in for them. So we've structured this very, very carefully to ensure that we're using our time smartly and efficiently so that what we're doing is we're bringing to the investors that smart managerial approach to things by making the best use of the resources that we have access to. Okay. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, so on that same note, uh, your contract dev, who's responsible for your contract? Was it a fork or? Sorry? You're, you're, so was sorry. It fork? No, your, your contract, was it a fork or have you, is this a fresh development? Uh, no, it's, it's a fork. Um, so it's a fork off of the, um, uh, sorry, Evergrow, Evergrow coin. Sorry, I thought I was mispronouncing that. Uh, it's a fork off the Evergrow coin um, with improvements that have been made. Um, we believe that uh, when we looked at it, considering this is the first time we are launching a contract, there's no way that we were going to take a risk by saying, oh, yeah, again, this plays back into our ethos, right? Uh, oh, look at us. We've, we've done this totally from scratch. Um, no, what we did was we took a look out there. Um, we took a look to see what contract has been out there long enough to have been thoroughly, thoroughly tested in the real world environment against various scenarios. And let's be honest, um, full credit where credit is due. The Evergrow team, um, they, their contract has been, uh, you know, rigorously tested, given that they grew all the way up to, uh, you know, an almost a one billion dollar market cap. Um, they've had hundreds of thousands, if not millions of transactions run through. Um, of course, bots have tried to hit it and everything. Uh, and it's a contract that that has really shown that it is a solid and reliable contract. Um, we have made some slight improvements to it uh, with the way the tokenomics work, with the, with the way the buyback and burn works. Uh, but no, we absolutely started with a with a tested contract uh, and then immediately went to the auditing to check things out as well. Yeah. Ever, ever grows a bit of a sore subject for me. So, <laughs> but um, no, so I'm not personal friends with the Evergrow team. Oh, no, um, no, I didn't but, mean it like you that. Know, I, I, uh, no, I no, meant, no. Uh, but from, you know, when I say, when I say I have to give respect where respect is due, you know, I, I mean, they've, they have put together a good contract from that perspective. Um, it has proven solid and reliable. So um, that that's where I'm coming at it from. Uh, and I, and I we're agree. also I not shy. To... Sorry, go ahead. Go on. <laughs> uh, we're also not shy to say we've used different sources. So. Yeah, no, no that's, that's fine. I mean, that, like you say, that goes back to your ethos, doesn't it? If there's something out there that, already exists and it works just improve on it and likewise with your outsourcing if there's somebody who can do it better and quicker for less of the time then so be it and, and that's and that's just it if i can jump in you know for instance um with the nft minting of course um we're partnering up with rug free coins uh, another well-known name in the space who's developed a name for themselves, who specialize in specific development. We're also talking to uh, Digital Fever about additional development. Again, another solid name. And, and, and why are we doing this? Uh, because like in the real world, uh, you know, if, if I run a business and I need a data center, I, I'm not going to try to build a data center myself and hire the 15, 20 people because that would cripple my operations. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go find a data center who already specializes in that, who will give me that service for pennies on the dollar versus what it's going to cost me. Um, and I will have access to a wealth of people that I would have never had access to before. So it's not just the outsourcing. It's outsourcing very smartly, making sure that we're partnering uh, with well-known vetted names. You know, these are not just, you know, uh, uh, contract jobs tossed up 
uh, for any, you know, lone developer to grab their hands on who's untested and unvetted. Um, you know, why would I go out, if, if I need new tires for my car, why would I go out and try to build my own tires, grow the tree, harvest the sap, boil the rubber? Uh, when, when I know I've got a, something better and faster and cheaper and, and much more worth my time, effort and energy uh, down the road. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But uh, while we just mentioned that then, but your NFT marketplace, what's yep. what's going to be different about this? Like in terms of, you know, there's, there's lots of NFT marketplaces out there. Sure. Uh, did you say marketplace or mint? Was it a marketplace? Uh, so starting with the NFT minting, uh, and then growing to the NFT marketplace. So we don't necessarily consider NFT minting or NFT marketplace uh, to be uniquely different than what is already out there. Um, like I said, what part of the goal of this project is to get investors to understand that these are all now basic services. Um, so as standalone developed apps, uh, liquidity pooling, staking, NFT minting, um, the NFT marketplace itself, the creator services, the subscriber services, these really all need to be considered basic services. Um, you know, uh, unless you're bringing something truly unique into them, th these are all basic services. So what we need to start doing as investors is realizing that because these are basic services, um, projects that have these spanned out over a period of months um, are much more novice in their understanding of how the crypto space works. Um, and as we do that, what we're doing is we're elevating our understanding of all crypto projects and we're able to better gauge the understanding of the team that's running the project. Because if we can deliver these in weeks by smartly partnering with companies that are providing these as services, um, then we develop a new standard. We set a new bar for minimum excellence. We also give investors a very solid base of belief and faith in the project team because they have delivered these things within a reasonable amount of time. Um, so yeah, the liquidity pooling, the NFT marketplace, the NFT minting, those things on their own. Um, no, no, there's not anything different than what's already out there. What is different though is what we're looking at when we've already established the basic services and we're looking past that. So for instance, uh, we're already in talks with another project uh, that we started these talks uh, almost a week and a week and a half ago. Um, they've already released their, their first version of a, a third person game app where inside of it, they've got um, a, an environment that supports building advertising, billboard advertising, road signs, street sign advertising. Um, you can earn uh, tokens of different um, um, uh, cryptos in there. Uh, they've got a digital NFT marketplace inside of there for the purpose of NFTs that support the gameplay uh, as well as rewards and risk. So we're in talks with them right now about linking into their utility, not from an advertising perspective, but their utility uh, to come back and support the project here. We're in talks with um, one developing, <clears throat> sorry, one development company um, that is looking at um, NFTs from a real world perspective. Uh, so Trent's background is real estate um, and there's a lot of talk and a lot of interest in NFTs that actually apply to real world real estate pro plot, well, plots of property. Um, and so we're talking to them and seeing where we can get in there. And then of course, as I mentioned too, we're already talking, we've already opened talks with Digital Fever uh, to see what's coming up, what's trending, what is the latest, because that's what we want to focus on. We want to get the basic services out to the investors so that we've established that level of trust in delivery, established that we're a solid team, and then start showing the team, okay, here's what we really should be excited about. Here's what, you know, uh, new crypto teams, new crypto projects should really be focusing on because this is what's going to elevate um, the entire crypto space. Okay. Yeah, that's a good answer. Um, just so, just com coming on to that, then. So, you, the, you, you're basically saying um, everything's going to be set up quite early on, uh, but that should be the bread and butter of every project coming out. Uh, you know, if it's related to them. So, uh, this kind of relates to the question that came from the floor, but. Um, uh, it's basically it's what is what making you unique as a reflection token. I think you've covered some of that with the ever earn is the solution uh, in the white paper there. But uh, is your plan at the minute bring out some 
real utility that's going to give you your USP later on. And at the minute, it's kind of uh, under wraps. Is that fair to say? It, it, that 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 is that is absolutely fair to say. Um, and, and we've specifically stopped the project map at February um, because we do believe. Um, you guys can hear me, okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we we do believe that there, and we've seen this within our own TG. We've we've heard this in some of the other AMAs um, where people are saying, "Well, that that again, that's an aggressive schedule, right?" Uh, because it hasn't been seen before in this space or seen very often, where a team is taking a you know business approach to managing how they're going to roll out the applications. Right. Um, one of the conversations that I had with uh, Digital F uh, Fever already is, of course, they said, so what's your pie in the sky? What's your, you know, your big, hairy, audacious goal? And I said, well, it's pretty simple. My big, hairy, audacious goal is, you know, a top 50 altcoin if, if I can have my way. Um, but that's part of the reason why I'm talking to you guys, because I fully understand that a top 50 altcoin isn't going to get there um, with an NFT marketplace, liquidity pooling and staking. Um, and I think that's where the failing of a lot of projects is, is they don't understand the fact that th these things are not really utilities. Sure, you can build the ecosystem um, to support your own currency in there and you can tax other currencies in there. But that's not really utility. I mean, that's that's sort of forcing utility. Um, I get NFTs, of course, are utility themselves. But again, it's it, it's all become very commonplace. Um, so our focus really is to show that we can deliver what we now call basic services and then immediately open up the rest of the roadmap to some of the things that we've already uh, are working on and have planned. And at that point, having, having established that this way of doing things works, um, then creates real interest and real investor interest in that they've already delivered A, B, C, D, and E. They, they've established that they have the ability to do this. So now I much more believe that they'll be able to go along the roadmap along this path and do so successfully. Yeah, so just a kind of a, a method of building confidence in your yeah. investors, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, can, I just, can I just jump just, in and, and, and ask, <clears throat> sorry, um, ask how you plan to, fund the development of the the true utilities that will be coming out later down the line uh yeah ab absolutely i mean the, the the funding is going to come uh out of uh the marketing and and the team wallets um we believe that if we can establish ourselves early on by delivering on the very early schedule uh roadmap um, that this is going to translate, of course, advertising and marketing also there, but this translates into investor confidence and investor confidence then takes us out of a project um, and pushes us towards being a business, pushes us upwards in the market cap. Um, and, you know, I realize Evergrow might be a sore spot, but, uh, you know, Evergrow has now established themselves with a daily market volume that is producing a, a, a good, solid, steady stream of income to continue to fund development. Um, and that's really why we want to have that first four to six weeks to establish ourselves like that in this space, establish that we have what it takes to do it this way um, so that the market cap and the daily trading reflects that and gets to a level where it becomes self-sustaining uh, to be able to afford to pay for the development that does have slightly longer um, rollout schedules and milestones. So just to just to go back to that that 5% wallet, then how, how many team members have you got, a core team? Uh, four. So if the four team members, and you're going to be using that 5% wallet, that's going to be earning BUSD, right? So That is correct, uh, yes. Your plan, that's that's the only wallet that's earning BUSD that you've got, is that right? That's correct. Well, so yeah. just to be clear as well, uh, just because you said that's the only wallet, um, so that wallet has been broken down into five individual wallets. Uh, again, they've all been uh, shared within our main TG and blacklisted. The reason the one wallet holding 5% has been broken down into five uh, is because at the present time, the current rug scan software um, doesn't like wallets holding more than 1%, um, so it creates false positives on those scans for that specific reason. Um, so we've broken it down into five wallets uh, to prevent getting that false positive, and we've been very open about that. But yes, so it's just the 5% as well as the 2% of taxes to marketing. 
Yeah, understood. Uh, do, do you feel that your 2% marketing is going to be enough? Is this the problem with reflection tokens? Uh, we've kind of sometimes noticed in the past is if the volume dies off, then obviously sure. the marketing uh, wallet does get affected. And without any sure. money in there, it can be hard to bring up that volume again. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, the, the, so obviously the marketing and advertising that's occurring right now and the development that's already been done um, has been funded by the team in advance. Um, so we've sort of prepaid for that. Of course, once we get through to um, the uh, the completion of the presale and we head into um, the live launch, uh, of course, the funding is covered by the presale, of course, 60% going into um, locked liquidity. Uh, so we're already speaking to our marketing people uh, who have proven quite effective, again, vetted marketing people um, with a much larger campaign. Um, so, uh, you know, we're talking in the fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 campaign price region. Um, and we understand that the campaigning and marketing and advertising has to remain strong. Uh, that said, though, again, this is why we put so much effort and energy into the token offering and the token structure. And again, why we've put so much effort and energy into uh, presenting the team as definitely presenting the project development um, as a very, very different approach than, than to what is normally seen in this space. Uh, do I believe the marketing at 2% is enough? Um, I do. Um, even at uh, uh, 500,000 uh, volume initially, uh, which we which we expect to be higher than. I mean, you're still talking about ten thousand dollars a day. Um, obviously, I can't see the future, uh, but we do believe that we've put together a whole package offering that is going to sustain the chart, buoyed by the fact that we will be delivering uh, the basic service apps very very quickly. So yes, we do we do feel confident. Okay. Is that um, your initial so just, target just, then? Uh, uh, Go on. And it's it's just a number that I'm using, for example. I'm I'm just wondering, like, just looking at your um, the the big utilities that hope to come in the future, and whether yep. you've calculated and put in targets in place to be able to know that you're going to be able to create those utilities long term. Sure. So just just to be clear too, and it, it's not. You know, it's it's not just the two percent of marketing off of trade volume. Uh, of course, uh, we've already worked out the numbers on how much the liquidity and the liqui sorry the liquidity and the staking, um, and the NFT minting and the NFT marketplace, uh, how much they're going to cost uh, because we got quotes in advance for that. Um, so all of that feeds back into the token the tokenomics, and of course, feeds into the marketing wallet. Um, so part of the ecosystem is developing additional revenue streams for the project so that it doesn't just rely upon the chart itself and upon people buying and selling the tokens. Um, so yes, while it is 2% to marketing uh, for buying and selling of the tokens itself, um, that is not just the only source of revenue that we're building in right from the beginning. Um, so we have thought about the need to ensure that we have a good steady stream of income coming in to support project development. Got you. Just, just, uh, just one noted thing there. You just said forty percent was going to the LP of the pre-sale, right? Sorry, sixty percent is going to locked liquidity. Sorry, My apologies. Yeah, yeah. no, no, I've written it down wrong. I've wrote, I've wrote forty percent down because I'm thinking, where's the other forty going? Um, so, what's your plan for the other forty? Are you market? Is it all marketing? Is it going to the buyback wallet or? Uh, yeah, no, the, it's, it's going to marketing. Uh, we have already spent, uh, north of, uh, $27,000 in marketing for the presale. Um, we do expect to be spending another 50 to $60,000 in marketing, uh, the moment that we go live. Um, so, I mean, that at the current price of, of B and B, that basically essentially recoups what's already been spent and pays for the immediate first couple of weeks of marketing. Um, our re our marketing reach so far with the marketing that we've spent um, is roughly an audience of almost a hundred million people. Um, so we are seeing good growth within the community. We did only just drop our marketing uh, on Sunday. Um, our Telegram room, I believe, we just passed two thousand people within the first few days. Um, so so we are getting um, traction, um, and we are seeing results on that marketing. 
um, and, and we are literally uh, doubling that effort. Um, we've got, of course, the Google Analytics turned on on the website so that we can see uh, where the in routes are on the website so we can measure which marketing is effective and which isn't effective um, so that we can adjust as we go along. Uh, and of course, like I said, we're partnering with vetted marketers um, and we're steering clear of those, you know, TG call outs to 100,000 rooms where they're all bots, right? Um, so really mm -hmm. trying to choose the most effective and most reliable marketing with the highest return on investment. Yeah, I, I've definitely seen the growth in your Telegram over the, the past few days. So there's, there's definitely something working. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. Just to check this, so 60% of your LPs, is that going to start your market cap around 400K? Is that about right? Um, well, I mean, according to Pink Sale, but of course, uh, we all know that Pink Sale um, doesn't quite calculate um, yeah. market cap the same way that uh, PooCoin and CMC does. Um, so, we, so we are targeting, um, to, again, depending on the price of B&B, &B, considering how much it's jackrabbiting, uh, we were targeting between uh, 750 and 900,000 as the starting market cap. And your starting LP will be? Uh Sorry, 60% of the pre-sale price, which I hadn't brought with me. Sorry, 60% of the pre-sale, which I had not brought with me. Uh, give me a second. Pre-sale. No, that's okay. Yeah, sorry about that. First person who's asked me that. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm always intrigued by uh, LP to market cap ratios when they start. It's um, uh, Yeah. It can be... Uh, so 600 BNB. What are we at for BNB right now for price? Uh, are we still at the 300s, 370s? For, it was 327. 327. Okay, so let's let's go with 327. Uh, so 600 BNB, and I'm on the wrong keyboard. So I've got notebooks all out in front of me and different screens actually, up and all sorts. It's actually, 381 now. <laughs> Sorry. 381? Yeah, it's actually 381 now. Okay, uh, so that puts the starting LP at around $137,000. Yep. Um, your anti-bot and anti-whale, let's talk about that for a minute. Sure. In fact, yeah, we're, we're on this conversation. I've missed something now, but I'll come back to that in a second. Um, yeah, you've decided so you, you've run in an anti-whale uh 0.25 uh 250 million max transaction yeah on both buy and sales yep um and you decided which is an interesting one for me is to run with no anti-bot on your launch do you want to talk mm. about that yeah absolutely um so you know if, if we take a look at uh anti-bot as a as a holistic solution um, and, and when I say that, I mean, let, let's take a real look at it because you can also take a look at, uh, you know, PinkBot as a really good example. Um, and, and, and largely what AntiBot is, is uh, purchase limits and, and time limits, right? Um, you can only make so many transactions within so many seconds. You can only purchase so many tokens within so much amount of time or in total, or there can only be, you know, for instance, one transaction from the same wallet within three to four seconds or longer. Um, you know, when we took a look at the, the higher altcoins and some of the projects that are doing very, very well in this space, uh, they also decided to really go light on those measures. And when we delve a little deeper into it, what we saw with a lot of contracts that, that contain a lot of anti-bot measures is that investors get caught up in those anti-bot measures, right? Uh, we all know that PancakeSwap uh, allows you to log in from you know multiple browsers, multiple computers. It's not that hard for a human person to push through three, four, five transactions all within the same one to two seconds. Um, and so that person then get, ends up getting caught in the anti-bot. Um, a person who's really trying to do a lot of day trading can get caught up in there. Um, if a person has a time limit where he can, you know, can't buy and sell for 15, 20, 30 seconds, it, it all comes back to um, people coming into their socials uh, or not, which would be even worse, but people coming back into the socials reporting that they can't buy and sell. Um, 
and and what's happening is is they're getting caught up in these anti-bot measures because these measures aren't actually identifying a human buyer versus uh, a, a computer buyer. It, it's it's using time limits, timers, and number limits to try and determine uh, what are the odds that you're a human versus a computer. Um, and and I we don't believe they're that they're, they are that yet there um, to do a whole lot more um, that then create buyer and seller frustration. Um, so we've made the decision that we we really don't want to interfere with the buying and selling process uh, of people. Um, we want people to be able to buy and sell as they see fit. We want sellers to be able to uh, sell when they when they feel the time is right, uh, and then be equally as happy uh, to ape back in uh, because they're confident about the way the project is being run and managed. They're confident about the ability to make money uh, on aping back in, um, and, and really allow um, that organic buying and selling to occur. Um, and again, you know, if, if you do look at the larger alts out there, uh, even some of the larger projects that are still down in this space, um, they, they do perform very well without putting in a whole lot of restrictions. Um, so that's what led us, led us down that, that path to that decision. Okay. It's, a, it's definitely an interesting one for me because I've seen both sides of it. I, I've seen uh, a bot get in with... Uh, 800 BNB at the launch of a token, and it just took the whole liquidity. Uh, granted, that was a fair launch, so you know the the LP was a lot lower. But uh, and, and then on the other hand, I've also seen you know so-called real people get caught up in it. Um, so and that's why it'll be an and, interesting and that, one. Sorry, go ahead. Yep, so uh, I you, you're right. Um, I mean, on that on that note, I would, you know, I'd have to tell people to be careful aping in at launch with a forty nine percent slippage, and you know, not buying the top. You know, you, in that situation, you might be waiting, better waiting for the chart to settle and see where you settle at. If you weren't in the pre sale, I think. Sure, sure, and, and, and you know, you bring up valid points, and, and truthfully, I think they're equally valid points, of course. Um, for any for any project, right? Um, it, it, yeah, we, I mean, it, it depends on your level of risk, doesn't it? I mean, we we, we had yes. one here the other day. Yes. Uh, sorry, did I lose you? Uh... If you, you get in now, this is high risk. You're going to buy the top, but uh, no, I myself invested what I you know, didn't mind losing. So it's uh, interesting, depending on each one's situation. I think, but I think it's definitely something people need to be aware of. Oh, absolutely. I fully agree. And, uh, you know, and, and that's the important part, right? Um, not every project out there fits each person's uh, investment style uh, in this space. Um, and that, that is really important and that cannot be understated. Um, you know, you, you've got those people out there who will stay away from um, tokens where there's a lot of anti-bot measures because they don't have confidence in it, uh, because, and let's be honest, I mean, it's no different than, than virus and malware software out there. For every anti-virus measure there is, there is a virus that has been specifically designed to beat it. Um, it I know myself, if I'm spending the money in bots and I know a token has anti-bot measures, I mean, it's not such a stretch for me to just have three or four copies of bots and do the exact same thing all using different wallets though um, mm -hmm. so that I don't get caught up in those anti-bot measures and that's why I'm saying like the I don't believe uh, I, I think that anti-bot has had a lot of really really good marketing um, but I, I don't think that faith is there in in anti-bot yet because it doesn't actually identify a bot I mean I've, I've definitely seen it cause complications oh yeah yeah no no, no. i'm definitely well, not right? yeah definitely not disagreeing with you on that i just uh, uh, I sorry I'm, I, I mean i mean i've seen yeah. anti anti bot create problems itself like you say like yeah you know yeah um yeah, there's, there's both sides to it let's yeah. just uh touch on that blacklist function uh sure. i personally don't see it as a bad thing some people do but uh you know if you've if you've got a hundred percent trust in a team uh, a blacklist can be a very useful function so let's talk about why why that's there why you've got it in sure yeah um the blacklist function um when we sat down and we were talking about it um and making decisions upon it um of course uh, i have covered the whole you know if we lock the wallets 
um, then we're also locked out of the BUSD rewards, which removes um, a significant amount of income out of the project, um, of course, which we're going to rely upon. Um, so the blacklist was uh, an easy win for us to be able to say, look, you know, we're, we're going to be doxxed, we're going to be KYC'd, we're going to be audited, uh, we will have all these trust features in there. Yes, the blacklist is going to show up on the audit. Um, why else would we, you know, why else can we justify having a blacklist function other than, of course, just those wallets? Um, and, and the answer is, is also to help with investors, which we've also seen in our past uh, experience. Um, so imagine you're an investor and you get that typical, uh, you know, hey, this is fake, Dave. Can you send me, you know, a million tokens and I will send this right back to you. Uh, and of course, I'm not careful. I go ahead and do that. And lo and behold, fake Dave is fake Dave. And now he's taken a million of my tokens. Um, we have seen instances where those people come in. They are legitimate in being scammed. They immediately start posting their transactions, showing that they've been scammed. And basically the team says, you know, we're really sorry, uh, but there's nothing we can do for you about that. Um, so that also solidified a, a blacklist feature for us where in that instance uh, where an investor comes forward and is able to prove they've been legitimately scammed out of their ever earned tokens, um, assuming the tokens are still in the, the scammer's wallet, uh, we would then be able to blacklist that wallet and at the very least prevent the tokens from being moved somewhere else. Uh, and then we could turn our attention to possibly helping the investor uh, in some way regain what was lost. Yeah. See, uh, with, a, with a fully doxxed team, I don't think it's a bad thing to have for that reason. And I've seen it utilized in that way and I've seen it work. So, yeah. I, I um, mean, again, one of our focuses is to elevate that, you know, in, in a in a trustworthy team to elevate those services that they can provide back to investors, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, let's just talk about one of your future plans. I don't, I don't know if this is a plan for launch or not. Um, your plans for that, is it, is it going to be a native, going to be rewarding native token? Uh, where are the rewards coming from it? Um, and when are you planning to, to implement it? Um, sorry, you, you cut out there at the beginning. I caught it where it said <laughs> native token. Okay, sorry. We're just talking about your staking, the, the, the plan staking yes. that you've got. Um, I was just wondering whether you're going to be, you know, the rewards are going to be a native token, uh, where the rewards are going to come from. Uh, are you still going to get reflections while you're staking? What's your plans for that? Uh, we ha So we actually haven't released the details on that just yet, um, only because we are still finalizing the details. Um, we want to make sure that the uh, tokenomics of staking is not only beneficial for the project, but also the holder. Um, so we haven't yet released the details on the staking. Uh, but we do expect to have those finalized within the next couple of days. Do you have any idea whether it's going to be a native po token or not? I've just I've I've been a part of projects and I've seen uh, native s tokens implemented in the staking, and it, all it's done is create sell pressure. So I'm wondering what your view of that is, or you can't discuss it yet. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean. Uh... I, I mean, I mean, what I can tell you is that we've been looking at the same. Um, that in some instances it's it's created cell pressure. Um, in in other instances, um, it hasn't. Um, I I can tell you that we're not looking at the reward for staking being in the native token. Okay. Um, so we 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 have decided that the reward will not be in the native token. Yeah, because my worry with that is you, you've already got eleven percent. Um, so oh, yeah, no, from no, the, yeah, the rewards yeah. selling, uh, and then if you yeah. couple that with some big handed whales, yeah, uh, no, selling no, no, their no. rewards, you know, but yeah, so I'm glad you thought about Absolutely, that. Yeah. Yep. One thing that, I, that brought my attention is the name of the utilities. I don't know if you're aware of another project that uses the, the same four letters that has quite a lot of utility. Um, I don't know if it was planned that way or you're not aware or what was the reason behind that if you did what i'm referring to uh you know I, I will be honest with you um it was not planned that way um yeah it it, it wasn't planned that way it's uh, i mean it's it's hard because they've actually got quite a lot of utility out um 
and some of yours might kind of cross reference, you know, and it might just get a little. Oh, bit you mean like the name like ever? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you. no, no, no. So yes, yeah, we 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 realize that. Um, sorry. Um, so we yeah we realize the name ever. Uh, within the white paper and stuff, um, did cross-reference over to others. Um, so we are going to be uh, looking at modifying that name. Um, I think it's a good idea from a, a branding yeah. point of view because, yeah. you know. The issue for us own. was, yeah, yeah, you, I, you're absolutely right. The issue for us was that um, when we realized the mistake we had made, and it, it was really just an oversight, um, when we realized the mistake we had made, we'd already released the website and the white paper and everything. Um, so we're like, okay, you know, you, you know how the community is. If you suddenly start changing everything right before pre-sale, um, it in of itself can create some FUD. Um, so we we intentionally haven't done that, uh, but it'll be the first thing that we'll address as soon as we get past the pre-sale that we're renaming those elements um, so that we don't have that cross confusion. Um, and yes, I'm fully aware of, of who we're referring to. So <laughs> I hold some of their token, in fact, but it just, it, you know, it was yeah. simple, a simple oversight. <laughs> no problem. Um, I think I just got, for me, just regarding the, the wallets, I actually know two more questions. So the, the wallets, how long are they locked for? Like particularly your exchange wallet, uh, your staking <laughs> wallet, you know, they're, they're big wallets. 20% and 15%. Uh, yep. So staking is set to be, staking and liquidity pooling is set to be out within four to six weeks. Uh, so, of course, there's a short lock on that because we would need to move it over. Uh, obviously, we would make sure to keep the community up to date on that lock. Um, if for some unforeseen reason we weren't able to meet that schedule, we would make sure to re engage the lock very early on. Um, but you know, with this with this time schedule, uh, within the next four to six weeks, uh, we would actually need to be able to access um, that locked staking wallet. Um, <clears throat> for the CEX, uh, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head because I closed my browser. I don't remember off the top of my head now how long the, the, the CEX wallet is for. Um, I'm hoping one of my team members in our main room can tell me. Um, yeah, we can come back to that in a second if you want okay. if someone uh, replies um this is, is another kind of question leading on from that but and it sure. kind of relates to a question from the floor as well but how long are you lock, planning to lock your lp for um uh, so the lp is immediately locked for 180 days yeah, um okay. yep six months um yep. again because of the aggressive roadmap um we, we didn't want to limit our options, um, especially if we are able to prove everything that we've proven. We expect to be in a very different place um, six months from now. Um, however, again, uh, we have no problem with the transparency. Uh, so one of the things that we are going to be doing immediately upon launch, uh, when all of those locks uh, do take effect, uh, is putting launch timers, visible launch timers on the website. So it is very, very clearly transparent, um, including an update as to uh, either what's going to be happening with them or when the locks are going to be re-engaged and for how long. Um, so we have yeah. no issues with that level of transparency at all. Six months for me is a good luck. Uh, you know, some, some projects overkill it. We, we, we spoke about this the other day and, and, and trying to prove to people it's, it's just the, the state of space I, I, is I in. Just, and, I just you know, saw I, a lock for 10 years. Like, I was yeah, like, what? And it's, 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 wow. it's not a good idea to me. Like, you know, like what if, what, like, I mean, as, as many arguments as there are uh, for why you want a good long lock, there, there's just as many arguments for uh, why you don't want that. Like, you know, I mean, obviously every project team hopes that they hit it on all four cylinders. So what happens when you do? What happens if you get the full buy-in of the community and the support? You know, what happens if you hit everything perfectly and all of a sudden you now need liquidity that you can't gain access to for 10 years? Mm -hmm. Yep. I right? Agree. I mean, it is a very, very costly mistake. Yeah, you have to be on a pivot. I mean, you, you've seen what happened with PancakeSwap V2, um, mm. you know, you've got to be prepared for that and yeah
It's a question from the floor from uh, Nick Papaji. He basically says, if any contract issues arise at the launch, um, post go live, what's your method for monitoring the contract? Uh, dev partners prepared to engage to help mitigate any issues? Um, yes. So you said, you know, I mean, it's a fork of uh, Everrise. Uh, so was it Everrise or Ever Ever Evergrow? Sorry, my apologies. No, um, okay. it's okay, Evergrow. It's a fork uh, of Evergrow. So, Hopefully there shouldn't be any issues because, you know, it's already been through everything, but we've, we've taken a pretty extensive and exhaustive look at the transactions of Evergrow, um, especially during the early days, uh, had to spend a lot of time downloading transactions to take a look to see, um, what issues may have arisen, uh, what issues there might have been. Uh, we're, we're highly, highly confident, um, that, 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 the contract is solidly and robustly tested. Uh, but yes, um, on the day of launch, uh, as I've said, uh, you know, we have jobs um, and uh, we're, we're taking time off to be available for that time um, so that we don't have any other commitments than to be there to ensure that this launches properly and that there are individuals who are monitoring it all the way through. Yeah, understood. Um... Got one more question from the floor as well, which is something I uh, I discovered, but I've actually found the answer to, but uh, it might benefit other people to know. Um, but what's the, the Cardano Evo connection? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you're not the first one to bring it up. Um, so, yeah, the, I can jump straight into that. Yeah, yeah, just to let, let everyone – I mean, I've, I've, I've found out myself, so I just yeah. – just for everyone else's benefit, I think. Yeah, no problem. Um, Cardano Evo uh, and also the attached Evolution project – um, was a project that uh, Trent and I were involved in initially as investors, like so many of us, um, uh, back in our, our early days, because Cardano Evo launched way back in, in May of last year. Uh, and of course, uh, we started out as investors. Um, we liked the direction that the team was moving in. Uh, we liked what we saw. Um, that was when we were, you know, initially formulating um, our own plans to see how we could get involved in crypto. You said Sorry, hello? world in there? Uh, no. Let me uh, do another one. Mine's in room. I'm sorry. Good. Sorry about that. Uh, that's okay. world. Yeah. Sorry, I'll just give us a okay, chance I to meet that person. It. Yeah, perfect. Yes, done. Um, and, and, you know, basically we, uh, you know, got involved as volunteers, not moderators, but volunteers, um, to help out with, uh, with marketing because that's where they were weak on. Um, and then we were, uh, you know, allowed to come in a little closer to the team, could still as volunteers, uh, and assisting out in marketing, uh, took a little bit more of a front role within the community, again, from the marketing perspective, but at all times we were unpaid volunteers. Um, we had no access to a marketing wallet. We had no access to dev wallets. We had no access to any funding of any sorts. Uh, and we took our direction uh, directly from the core team. Um, unfortunately, um, as Trent and I were finishing up um, the latest round of marketing development, which was a redevelopment of their website, uh, literally a week away from delivering their new website. Um, and we had discussed with the core team uh, Trent and I backing away from the project uh, because we had been developing EverEarn on our own. Um, literally a week before we were to back away from the project, um, there was a fight uh, amongst the core team um, and one of the uh, core members decided to sell uh, tokens out of a dev wallet. Um, didn't sell the whole amount. Um, in fact, didn't even sell, uh, didn't even sell 20% of what was in that wallet, um, but intentionally sold uh, an amount of tokens out of the wallet, um, had his son uh, who do the exact same thing out of his personal wallet, but created a very large red chart on the graph, uh, which investors immediately took notice of. Um, and upon taking a look at those transactions to see who sold, investors immediately realized that it was sold from a dev wallet because it was also tax-free wallet. Um, and that created a massive amount of FUD within both communities and the chart. Um, that dev, the core team immediately locked him out. He walked away with four or $5,000 in, in cash. Um, and basically I got stuck uh, telling the community what happened. And shoot the messenger. Um, 
Well, you know, and I, and I, I and uh, this is why I have no problem talking about it because uh, full transparency, uh, I had no involvement in it. I didn't know it was going to happen. Um, I had my own wallet in there, which which just tanked. Um, you know. Um, but I knew there was a responsibility to the community to at least communicate what was going on. Um, there really was pandemonium there for a bit. Um, so I did step in. Um, I did tell the community what had occurred. Uh, I made sure everybody knew what was going on. The main developer, um, Usama, is still there. Um, he is trying to redo the contracts and rebrand the project. Um, because the voice from the community was that they wanted the, con the, the project to continue. Um, but he is going to suffer a tremendous uphill battle um, because they, that's, you know, once a member of the core team does something like that, I mean, you've, you've just burned a, you've burned a lot of bridges that can't be crossed back. So, yeah, it's going to be a tough job for him, I think, but, but he is not... still there. So, yeah, he's still working on it. That is testament to him, right? But so. just on that note, uh, the only person with keys to. Sorry. Is that right? Sorry. The only person with, with, with keys to your marketing wallet in. Um, Toby, you're breaking up. Is, is just you, right? Yes, sir. No. Yeah. Sorry. You, yeah, you're, you're breaking me? up. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Uh, yeah. So you, just to, to put that out there. Yep. Um, yeah, so I think that about sums up all of my questions and everything. Um, so, you know, it makes up the uh, the core of the AMA. And I guess we'll just take some questions from the floor and everybody else, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Does anyone I, I have any to admit, questions? very, Sorry. very, very good questions. I do appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate the responses as well. I know sometimes, um, you know, it's all in the name here. Uh, we like to try and vet projects as much as we can so people can make their own decisions on everything that's laid out in front of them. Um, and that's kind of what we're about, really. Yeah. So, but yeah, if anyone's got any questions for Dave, now's your chance. I'll, I'll jump in, Dave. Um, just on the uh, CEX listing, obviously you've said 15% of taxes are going towards those listings. Um, but as a reflection token, obviously you've got high um, taxes. Larger exchanges obviously don't like high um, taxes. How are you going to go about getting listed when they don't like high taxes? Yeah, and, and we've and, and thank you for asking that, Mark. Um, uh, so in our white paper, we we've fully admitted that, of course, uh, a lot of the exchanges out there fully don't support. Um, the tokenomics, right? Um, so we have set aside tokens for exchanges. Um, it, we're, we're not necessarily in a rush to get on an exchange um, for a couple of reasons. One, because simply making yourself available to be bought in more places um, doesn't mean it's beneficial for you, right? I mean, you can open a store uh, in a one specific area of the city. Uh, you've got a good amount of customers coming in, uh, but that doesn't mean opening a second location right away means you're going to have double the volume happening. Um, so, so we're going to take our roadmap to exchanges rather slow. We do need to gauge, of course, the supply versus the demand um, for, you know, for at least a couple of weeks before we make a decision on, on what we're doing on exchanges. Uh, and even then, we then have to measure whether or not the demand is really there um, to list on an exchange. You know, for instance, Binance. I mean, Binance is what, 120 or 100, $120,000 just to get on their exchange. And then they don't support tokenomics, uh, yeah. right? So what is the benefit to the, what, sorry, let me rephrase that. What legitimately is the benefit to the investor to rushing to get onto an exchange? Sure, you can say, ah, you know, we're in talks with this exchange to see what they can do for us from a tokenomics perspective, but there's no talking. The exchange either supports tokenomics or it doesn't. Those are your options. You know, they're not chasing us to get us listed. There's no benefit for them other than that they're going to make commission on everything that's sold. Um, so 
you know, the, the decision to move to an exchange needs to be one that's done very carefully. Uh, we need to consider all of our options. I mean, Coinsbit is a perfect example of early exchanges that tokens get onto because it's really easy to get on there. So it's, it's like $10,000 still to get on there. Um, but okay, so great. Now you can be bought on Coinsbit. And what is the incentive for investors to buy you there? Um, there's no tokenomics. Now you absolutely have to commit marketing dollars in order to even bring awareness to your token there. So that means you have to dedicate time, energy, and money. And if the volume isn't there, um, then just the volume alone, the benefit from the volume alone doesn't benefit anyone from this side of the fence. And now, for as long as your token is there, you have this really big red failure uh, because you've gone and wasted investor money getting onto ex an exchange without thinking about whether or not it was actually going to benefit you. But we realize that, you know, d again, depending on the amount of traction out there, depending on the level of interest, depending on a number of factors, um, you know, at some point, an exchange would be attractive to us that may happen sooner than we expect or later than we expect. Um, but at least we have the token set aside so that when and if that time comes, um, we don't have to uh, pull it straight out of uh, the tokens that are over here in this side of the environment. Just on that note, have, have you thought about what you'd want to do with the tokens if you decided not to go with an exchange listing? Uh, we have. Um, and, uh, I mean, obviously we haven't made any firm decisions, um, but you know, the, the predominant idea is, is would, would be to burn the tokens. Okay. Yeah. That, like I, I fully agree with what you're saying. Like a lot of the time tokens just use an exchange listing for a bit of hype and that's all it is. It, it never really amounts to anything and it's just a waste of resources. Right, but, but I mean, if the demand is there, right? Like if you're yeah. able to gain that traction and the demand is there, then you need to be ready. But, yeah. you know, I've seen tokens where they're like, okay, guys, today's our day one launch. You know, the moment we hit 200,000 market cap, we're submitting our token for listing on Coinsbit. Why? <laughs> what? What? Yeah. What? Where, what is the purpose of that? Right? Like, because, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyways, thank you. I appreciate that question. Anyone else uh, want to ask Dave anything while he's here? Now's your chance. I think there was actually another question just from um, on the chat. In okay. terms, so I'll just say, in terms of the pre-sale, am I right in thinking it's the 27, uh, 8 p.m. UTC, and, it, and, and it's public pre-sale? That is correct. So the pre-sale is January the 27th, 8 p.m. UTC. The launch date is January the 28th, which is the Friday, also, 8 p.m. UTC. Thank you, Doug. And it's via Pink Sale, isn't it? Was there a reason for choosing Correct. Pink Sale? Uh, I, I mean, um, you know, uh, our experience in the past had been with Pink Sale, um, so we went with what we knew. We knew that, uh, of course, Pink Sale takes uh, a B and B flat fee. Um, as part of uh, getting it all set up, we were also fully aware of the fact that they'll take 2% of the tokens that are sold during the pre-sale. Uh, we've already communicated to them that we will be buying that 2% back right away so that there is no risk, uh, as has been, you know, uh, suggested by some that, you know, Pink Sale will then dump on us after we launch. Um, so we immediately addressed and mitigated that risk by letting them know that we absolutely will be buying them back. Um, they will be burned. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, they've got the locked liquidity mechanism. So, I mean, um, you know, it was really a toss up between them and, 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 and DX sale, really. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, the, the statement was what antibot systems in place for, uh, the pink sale, um, he's tired of getting into public pre-sale that gets sold out in two seconds, but there's not a lot you can do about it. Sure. That uh, well, so, and, and I mean, this, this actually, actually, this conversation has been a lot within our own TG as well, um, as people are saying, you know, okay, what, what pre-sale anti-bot measures are in place? And, you know, I, I have myself gone to the pink sale group, um, and I, and I asked that question, what uh, anti-bot measures are there specifically for pre-sale? Um, you can go, you can see that, you know, my name will be in there, that I've asked that question, you know, what, what specific pre-sale anti-bots does pink sale offer to help with that um, and i keep getting referred back to their main anti-bot page um, which is the same thing that we've talked about already which is 
you can implement a timer uh, for the amount of transactions that a wallet can do between buys and sells, which of course has nothing to do with a pre-sale. Uh, you can limit the number of tokens that a wallet can purchase at any one time, which there's already a min and max in the pre-sale. Uh, you can limit the number of transactions that happen within a certain block, but it's a pre-sale. Um, so again, you're limited to the amount of BNBs that are defined in the pre-sale. So there isn't, there isn't actually anything specific to stop bots from buying in a pre-sale. Um, and, and not even Pink Sale was able to provide me with information that could confirm otherwise that there is in fact anything specific to a pre-sale bot um, that, that isn't also potentially going to cause a problem for a, a normal investor, a human investor. Now, I, I reserve the right to be wrong, of course, <laughs> uh, but you know, going to the Pink Sale uh, uh, community and asking them about specifically a pre-sale bot, um, they were not able to direct me towards anything. No, I, th I think sometimes the uh, the best anti anti bot feature in a pre-sale would just be the the hype and it filling up so quick <laughs> that stops anyone getting more than two wallets in. Right, yeah, like yeah, I mean, uh, you know, and, and I get it. Don't get me wrong, I, I get it. Everybody wants in. Um, to the pre-sale, of course, everybody wants in. Um, you know, if you've got three, four, five hundred people uh, with a 600 BNB hard cap who all want in and they're all clicking buy within the first two, three seconds at the same time, um, you know, sure, yeah. Oh, look, I didn't get in because of a bot. Um, okay, well, you know, the, the problem is there isn't actually a solution um, that's going to stop a computer from buying. And that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's there's some launch launch pads coming out soon. I think that will be interesting to see how they develop in regards yes, to, yes. to stuff like that. So again, Absolutely. it's one of these things that constantly changes and the need to pivot in crypto. So let's see how that pans out. Yeah. Anybody else with any questions before we finish up? I don't have a question, but uh, I'm ready to get some of that ever cheddar. <laughs> <laughs> ever cheddar. I like it. There we go. You're going to have to get a meme made up for that now. <laughs> I like that. Well, Dave, uh, Thank thanks you, very much yeah. for your time, man. It's, it's been nice talking to you. Um, it's been good to get to know a bit more about what's going on here. And thanks. I really appreciate the opportunity. We'll definitely uh, get this get it shared out to everyone, everyone who couldn't make it and stuff, and uh, I'll pass you along a copy. Excellent. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it, Tobster. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, you know, legit crypto community, uh, thank you so much um, uh, for your warm welcome. Thank you so much for the engagement in, in conversation today. I've really enjoyed being here, uh, and I look forward to seeing uh, everyone on pre-sale day and go live day, um, and looking forward to seeing where we can take this project. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you.